and welcome to this episode of the Good Citizen Podcast. Well, last week we marked the 200 episode milestone for the podcast, and we were right in the middle of a, a key story with Representative Shackelford and Stairwald. So I, I did not want to interrupt that. Uh, so this week I wanted to take a moment and kind of mark that milestone and share with you uh, five lessons that I have learned about my role as a citizen in the time that we've been doing this. So we launched the podcast in 2017. It's taken us since then to get to 200 episodes. And I've just been blessed to talk to so many key leaders, uh, both those that are perhaps well-known, but then also those that are just laboring in the trenches, doing great work and catching their stories. Uh, we did launch with the, the name, the Bold Church Podcast, the idea of helping the church to be confident in changing times. But really, the idea has remained the same. How can we, as committed Christians, live out our faith? exercise our citizenship in a way that is worthy of the gospel. Uh, tough to do, um, and there's so much to think through in this space. So that's what we've endeavored to do. And so I wanted to share with you again five lessons about Christian citizenship that I've learned in these 200 episodes. As I launch in, I was thinking about a, a quote from Winston Churchill, who said that the empires of the future are the empires of the mind. Uh, of course, Winston Churchill had a, a number of things to say uh, that make you think this is one that I've been mulling over recently. Uh, and I do think the struggle that we see in our culture, the, the struggle for the soul of the United States comes down to the mind, uh, to differing ideas about freedom, about truth. We often say on the podcast that a lot of the struggle in American culture can be summarized as differing views of freedom. One view of freedom being basically freedom to build a society according to God's good design, and the other view of freedom being a freedom from God's authority and uh, a freedom to build a society according to our own designs. And so, again, these ideas, um, the future, uh, the empires of the future are the empires of the mind, and we see ideas kind of taking hold, reigning in people's lives and in our society, and it is to this battle of ideas um, that we come each week, think through, okay, how do we understand these ideas? And then how do we go apply our faith in a culture that's affected by them? And so I thought that that quote nicely summed up the struggle that we face. So again, five lessons about citizenship that I've learned in 200 episode, episodes. Here's number one. Number one, gospel-centered citizenship is part of discipleship. So as we launched in 2017, I, I had a calling I felt a calling on my life uh, really since high school uh, to impact this area, help spread the gospel, defend religious liberty, and then help renew the American experiment. And so it was a, a calling that I felt on my life. And as I've been trying to explain it and explain that calling, but also explain public theology to other Christians, uh, the idea that I keep coming back to as I talk to pastors and others, a very simple one, and that is that it's a part of the Great Commission. We're supposed to go teach everyone everywhere, everything that Jesus had has commanded us. And so we are to follow Jesus in every area of our lives, including our role as citizen. And sometimes that gets left out. We like to kind of split our lives, separate them. Uh, we use the, the illustration of the lunch tray. If you caught the episode with Eric Cooper, which I think is just such a great example of how Christians should not do the Christian life and splitting up their life into the sacred and the secular. And so Philippians 1.27 has become a, a driving verse for us, that verse where Paul says, you know, Paul, the, the Roman citizen in Roman chains, writing to Greek Christians under Roman domination, he says, let your citizenship, your poly to am I, how you do life in your city, um, let your citizenship be worthy of the gospel. And so that one area of the Christian life, and there are many, our, our financial lives, how we um, live out our faith as a parent or as a student, an employer, an employee, but certainly in our role as citizen, are we exercising that in a way that's worthy of the gospel? And so again, I, I think that our role as citizen, this is just one part of discipleship of the Christian life, but it is a part of the Christian life. It's not, not something that should be separated from it. And I think this is especially true in the American system. If you've heard uh, if you've heard sermons or if you've read the book, you know that I'll often say that we are Caesar. When Jesus says, render under Caesar, that was the individual with ultimate authority in the Roman system. Well, who has authority in the American system? Well, we do as citizen sovereigns. So 
I believe in the American system, especially we have authority and therefore responsibility to engage this role. I've been reflecting some on 2020. And as I've talked to a number of pastors, this comes up. And I do believe that if you exercise your citizenship in a way that's worthy of the gospel, it can point people to Jesus. But if, if, any, if 2020 proved anything with the divisive election, it is that at least if citizenship is done poorly, it can detract from gospel ministry. And so a lot of pastors that really had not thought much about uh, the public square, just focused like they should, they're making disciples, they go and make disciples, all of a sudden this issue of politics is one that they can't escape. Uh, so many pastors would tell me they had people leave their church because they would not, from the pulpit, say, uh, you know, who you have to vote for. Rather, they just preach about biblical principles. And so this became an issue that, okay, well, yeah, we, we do need to be teaching on this. And one of the things that I keep talking to pastors about, and something that I've learned through this exercise of doing 200 episodes, is that if the church does not step into that role, if the church does not teach on this issue, just like if the church doesn't teach on sexuality or on finances, someone or some force is going to teach Christians how to do this, how to exercise their role as citizens. So we shouldn't leave a vacuum of discipleship on the issue of citizenship. So again, I, I see gospel-centered citizenship as just one aspect, one part of discipleship. It's not everything, for sure. There are a lot of other areas in the Christian life, but it is an area of the Christian life. And again, I become more and, and more convinced of the importance of this idea, of this teaching, and that's why we're going out preaching in churches. We'll continue the podcast. How do we help disciple people that are following Jesus and their role as citizen? One last thought on this point is I, I have been burdened, and again, just speaking frankly here, uh, by the, the lack of solid, what I might call public theology. We use that term often, but basically biblical principles on the issue of citizenship or how you do life in the public square. And this is true among Christians in the pew, but I also will mention that I think it, it's also true among Christians that hold public office. And you may think that I'm blaming them, that I'm picking on uh, those that are become, have become elected public servants, that sometimes when speaking to them about biblical principles, uh, there's just a very surface-level understanding of what Scripture speaks about on these issues. Well, that's, that's not the public official's fault, in a sense. Rather, it is the church's job to be discipling people about how they do this role. Again, I'm not here to say that the church has to tell uh, an elected official, and perhaps um, Representative Wesco is a great example of both a legislator and a pastor. It's not that the, the elder or deacon board of a church has to tell that person, you have to vote this way on each bill, but rather giving that person the biblical underpinnings of living a life that's faithful to Christ as they exercise their citizenship in that role. And so, again, that's a, a big one, a, a huge lesson that I've learned, and one that I come back to all of the time. I'm convinced of this, that gospel-centered citizenship is just one aspect of discipleship, but it's also an important one. And so it's one that we should focus on. I would say lesson number two is that gospel-centered citizenship faces external threats. And when we launched this in 2017, there was a bit of a, a hiatus on some of these religious liberty issues, certainly over the last, oh, you know, 10 months or so, and, and some before that, certainly with Supreme Court cases, um, that hiatus is over. And so those that will exercise their faith in the public square are going to face challenges. They're going to face external threats. It's just a reality. It'd be great if we could just come on the podcast and say, you know what, you don't have to worry about that. Just keep doing what God's called you to do. And, and don't you don't have to worry about any of these legal issues. And unfortunately, that's just not the case. There, You still have to mind what's going on in public life due to threats to uh, most particularly religious liberty. You think about the Equality Act um, and the, the threat that it would pose to ministries that hold an orthodox view of human sexuality, being able to carry out their ministry activities in the public square. I was listening uh, recently to an extended podcast series on the French Revolution. Uh, what's just listening back through this one, one part of the French Revolution that I had not thought about, in fact, not even sure I had heard about before, 
was a, a big part of the French Revolution, of course, was uh, religious in nature. But at one point, uh, the revolutionary figures, the head of the revolutionary government, government there, required priests in, in France to make a civic oath, um, to swear a civic oath, basically allegiance to the state rather than allegiance to the church or allegiance to God. And in a sense, some of what's going on with the Equality Act and others is you must, in a sense, swear allegiance to the government's view of human sexuality, or you have to face the consequences. And so I was just thinking about that comparison. Now, certainly that's there, there's not actually a civic oath at this particular point. I'm not saying that, but you can see the parallels if government is in a sense kind of pointing its sword at the church saying, hey, we know what's true, good, and beautiful, and therefore you have to follow our view of that, which is exactly backward from the biblical um, mandate of the biblical explanation of the roles of church and state. So certainly the issue of religious liberty. And then freedom of speech, uh, to be able to say what is true, especially as we see a, a number of challenges coming to Christians uh, in the public school system that are being told they have to use uh, preferred pronouns, and they have to wrestle with their conscience on, um, can I in good conscience say this if I believe that it's false? And so that's a, a challenge. It's a complication. Things like parental rights, being able to parent a child in the way that the Christian believes is true and correct. And perhaps one of the biggest ones that I run into often is just this idea of cancel culture or the chilling effect of a more secular culture pushing back on Christians saying, you know what? That's just not what we do in polite society or in professional organizations. And so I see many Christians kind of shrinking back from their role as citizen, declaring what is true, good, and beautiful because of the perceived consequences or perhaps the actual consequences of doing so. So someone that's going to exercise a gospel-centered citizenship is going to face these external threats, just like many of the biblical characters, the Christians down through the ages. Those that are looking to follow Jesus in this area of their lives are going to have to be mindful of these external threats. I had hoped when we started the podcast that some of those, again, would, would be going away, that things would be getting better. Unfortunately, there are still a number of challenges. I, I will say this along on the front, though. Um, I, I really am not a kind of chicken little um, advocate in the sense that the, the sky is falling. We've lost all religious freedom. Actually, we, we have a number of religious liberty protections. Uh, one way that I've, I've heard it described is that we actually have greater protections than ever um, due to some of the Supreme Court cases. However, we have less power than ever. And so the, the loss, or at least perceived loss of influence in our society is what is, is truly concerning. So we certainly have a number of freedoms. We should be grateful for them, and we should use them in our society. So that would be lesson number two. We will face external threats. There's just no way to get around it. Uh, lesson number three, gospel-centered citizenship faces internal pressures. So it, it certainly will face external threats, but then I would, would say that this type of, of citizenship also faces internal pressures. And this was, this was a development that I did not, uh, frankly, I did not expect. Um, and when I began to experience it for the first time, it left me very unsettled. Because it's one thing to have someone that doesn't share your worldview or your belief in Christ uh, question your motives, um, come after your strategy in a sense. But there, there certainly are going to be internal challenges, different views of citizenship and how it should be exercised that will, will be a challenge to someone that wants to exercise this type of citizenship. So uh, one, one thing would be what I might term uh, the Jerusalem approach, if you remember the episode on Jerusalem or Babylon, in a sense, is the United States more like this monolithic religious society that we must kind of force back, you know, win back from uh, the pagans, and it must absolutely reflect that uniformity of belief? Or are we more like Babylon, a, a multicultural, diverse society in which we have the opportunity to pray for and provide wisdom to governing officials? And of course, the conclusion in that episode was, I do believe it's, it's more like a Babylon. Uh, that's where we find ourselves. And we should look to people like Esther, Daniel, Nehemiah uh, for inspiration in these times. But of course, there are those that would disagree uh, with that characterization. And I would see that as a conscience issue. Uh, but there, it can be fairly strident at times. Those that uh, see this approach of, of trying to do the best that we can in this particular type of society as some, some form of compromise or not being strident or hard enough 
And I certainly welcome that pushback because we do need to to stand up for truth. And there there might be moments when I'd be inclined to um, try to navigate that rather than just to, to make a blanket statement if this is true. Um, so that's a helpful perspective. But I do think, again, this this type of, of citizenship faces that pressure of those that are more strident, that those that are tempted to jeopardize biblical principles in pursuit of short-term political gain. That's always going to be a tension. That's always going to be a temptation. And so that's, as in the church, as Christians trying to do this well, we will face that internal pressure pushing us towards, hey, you, you've got to engage in such a way as to, we've got to win this election or all is lost. And again, we should engage. I think we should would do, should do our best um, because elections definitely have consequences, but there's going to be a tension there. I, I think there's going to be a tension to also focus exclusively on issues that one party or the other sees as important. And that's why we put out uh, the podcast episode, you may have seen the graphic on the church's public witness, that we, we should just focus on what one party or the other wants to talk about. Rather, we should look at the Imago Dei, the fact that we're all created in God's image, and that should be the foundation for our, our witness in the public square. And so we should care about things like the sanctity of life, the Christian sexual ethic, religious liberty for all people. But we should also care about ethnic unity and justice and about the Matthew 25 issues, care for the poor, the prisoner, and the immigrant. Now, again, Christians will disagree in good conscience on exactly how to do that well in the public square. My point is, it is something we should be talking about. It is something we should care about. And there's going to be a tension, uh, a temptation, to just focus on the issues that one party talks about rather than on the full counsel of God. Um, so we will face that internal pressure. Another pressure I think that we will will face as Christians trying to exercise this type of citizenship is that there'll be a temptation to see core doctrine, see an issue um, as a core doctrine rather than an issue of conscience. So many issues in the public square are more of a, a jagged line issue, as uh, Jonathan Lehman described, rather than a straight line issue. Or the, the principle's clear, but there can be differing strategies. And it's very easy to fall into, well, my strategy is better than yours, and you have to follow my strategy or you're not following Jesus. And we have to resist that temptation. And I, I welcome anyone that comes into public square and wants to promote truth, uh, certainly have some strong disagreements sometimes on, on how it's done by certain groups. But I do believe that's more of a conscience issue. I actually just had a conversation like this with a pastor who feels, he feels called more to a prophetic Role. I'm grateful that he's speaking truth, um, but I, I think we can be tempted to see our strategy as the strategy all Christians must follow, or they're not doing what's proper or correct. And the danger of that is our movement of gospel-centered citizens splintering into a thousand little cliques um, and having no real influence in public life because of that. So again, that's number three, and this one has been a difficult one for me to try to to handle to face. Again, being criticized by those that share my belief in Christ, uh, not something that I, I expected. But certainly anyone that's engaged in the public square is going to get some of that. So again, gospel-centered citizenship is going to face internal pressures. The fourth lesson that I've learned uh, after 200 episodes is that gospel-centered citizenship works. And I actually mean that in kind of two ways. The first one is that it actually does work. <laughs> uh, and I'll juxtapose that to... Uh, just a keyboard warrior. And, and certainly we do need pundits, we do need analysts, and we need people out there speaking on social media. But I think you get my point. There are a number of individuals that just get so angry, um, that's, that are screaming at others over social media. But when you ask them, well, when was the last time you ran for office? Or are you involved in the, the primary contests? Um, have you looked into the, the ministries that are actually working in a particular space to solve the problem? Um, have you done boots on the ground type of work to help solve this? And so I, what I think gospel-centered citizenship, and again, it's not uh, anything that I've said, it's what the scripture calls us to, to do good works that point to Jesus, that this type of citizenship, it, it does comment, um, it does speak to issues, but it also works. It gets down there. Um, into the dirt in a sense, trying to plant new efforts, uh, trying to keep out the bad roots as well, but trying to make an actual difference rather than just complaining about it. Um, so this uh, exercising a citizenship uh, that 
that reflects the gospel, it does work. It, it's not just going to sit sit back and complain or watch as things get worse. It's actually going to be in the fray. It's going to get into what might appear messy or dirty and try to make a difference. So that I, that's kind of the first meeting, that this type of citizenship actually works. But the second one is I, I do think it is actually the effective, the most effective strategy for the coming years. And if you remember back to the episode with Bob Vanderplatz and this church-led state-based strategy for renewing the United States, it is the most logical strategy that I have seen in the quickly changing times in which people of faith seem to have less influence than, than they have in previous decades. So how are we going to transform our city, state, and nation? Is it just going to be by winning back the White House? Is it going to be, back, be by winning Congress multiple times? We've had a lot of electoral success over the last 30 to 40 years, but where are we culturally? Um, and so what are we going to do now? And so I do think that this is the most effective strategy for the next 30 years. I encourage you to listen to that episode by, by Bob Vanderplatz on that. What if every Bible preaching pastor in a state is building relationships with elected officials, ministering to them, partnering with them for the common good? What if our churches are building uh, great disciples, building strong disciples who just so happen to be good citizens? What if they're impacting their zip codes and together we can transform our city, state, and nation through the power of the gospel. That's why I believe gospel-centered citizenship works. It's a, it's a hopeful strategy, but it's also a, a realistic strategy of where we are right now. So again, that kind of double meaning there, gospel-centered citizenship actually works. Don't just scream at people. Let's go do something. Let's actually make a difference. But then also let's focus on a strategy that best we can reflects where we are in a culture and is hopeful about what we can do in the time that God has given us. That leads me to, to lesson number five, and that is that gospel-centered citizenship is an expression of faithfulness. It's an expression of faithfulness. A pastor recently asked me for an example of citizenship in the New Testament, and I went straight to the Apostle Paul. If you've listened to the podcast for some time, you know that Paul was fairly unique in that he had Roman civitas, or citizenship. And it's interesting how he, he used that. He could have very easily said, well, you know, I have, I don't have the power to vote. I can't change the fact um, that we have a pagan emperor, and I don't think that pagan emperor is going to reflect or pursue biblical principles. And so I'm just going to kind of put that on a back shelf and not care about it. No, instead, he used his civitas as a tool. He, he often put it to work to further his ministry. Uh, for example, uh, preserving or protecting the public witness of the church he started in Philippi. And then also appealing to Caesar uh, so he can have an audience in Rome, just a, a few examples. And so I believe that Paul, you know, he saw his civitas as something to steward. Um, it was a tool that could be used. He was a Roman citizen, and so he was going to use that to further the work of the ministry. And I see American citizenship in a very similar light. God's put us here in this place in this time with, with this citizenship. So we should engage it. We should use it. And so I say that Gospel-centered citizenship is an expression of faithfulness, uh, meaning it's stewarding something that God has given to us rather than just kind of stepping back and letting it go. I also think that some American Christians treat citizenship different than other responsibilities. If, in fact, this is a responsibility that God has given to us, uh, we engage it differently. Uh, for example, uh, the responsibility of parenting a child. Um, Biblically, as uh, Christians, we don't look at that and say, you know what, parenting is difficult, it's dirty, unless your children are or, or were angels. <laughs> um, and parenting can be tough, can be hard. We don't go to our kids and say, you know what, you disobeyed me again, therefore I'm putting you up for adoption. <laughs> okay, uh, That's not how at least we should handle it. Um, the same, I would argue, is true about citizenship. We, we shouldn't look around and say, you know what, uh, maybe this last effort, it didn't seem to work out that well. Culture is changing. It's turning against us. Therefore, I'm out. And I see other Christians that do it poorly, so therefore, I'm out. Um, I'm just going to focus on other ministry endeavors. If, in fact, citizenship is something God has called us to do, then it's, it's not something we should abdicate. We should step in, and we should manage those tensions, and we should be good stewards of what God has called us to. And I just think about the remarkable benefits that, that American Christians have, that Christians down through the ages, and even Christians in other places around the world today would just dream about some of the things that we have. Certainly some of our rights are 
under pressure, even under attack, but we still have remarkable freedoms uh, to worship, to live out our faith and our culture, and to try to change hearts and minds. Uh, so let's, let's do the best that we can to steward what God has given to us. He's put us here in this time, in this place, with American citizenship. So let's be good stewards of that. Let's be faithful with it. Now, I, I wish I could come to a close in this podcast and say, you know what, I'm, I'm confident that God is going to have us play the role of more of a Nehemiah. We're rebuilding the walls, um, seeing a spiritual renewal. But I don't know. I don't know what, what God is doing in our times. Perhaps he has called us to more of the role of a Jeremiah who proclaimed the truth to his people, but they never turned. And he experienced the fall of Judea to, to Babylon, how painful that must have, have been. Um, I often say that I don't know God's plan. He's, he's almighty. He's a turtle. But I do know his principles. And I do know that he's called us to exercise a citizenship that is worthy of the gospel. And so are we going to do that well? Uh, the, again, the last thing that I've learned, and I think about this on hard days, and when I'm discouraged, and when I see America changing so quickly, um, the, the reason I engage is, is not just because our efforts are successful. The reason I engage is because it's something I'm called to steward. Uh, and regardless of the outcome, I'm called to that. And, and I'm going to stand by it. I'm going to do my very best to be successful. I want to see elections won. I want to see public policy reflect what is true, good, and beautiful, what's good for our neighbor. But regardless of what happens in the coming years, I believe I'm called to steward this citizenship well. Uh, so I think that's a really key principle as we look to the future. As we come to a close today, I, I wanted to share with you something that I experienced this past weekend. Had the chance to be in New York, had a chance to go with the actually the chaplain there at the State House to see the New York State House. Now, some people they like to go see baseball stadiums or football stadiums. I go to see state houses. And that probably pretty officially stamps me with a political nerd status. <laughs> um, but I, I do enjoy going to see where other people minister, but also the, the state houses around the country. And the New York State House, you can Google it. It is interesting. There's no dome. Um, it, it looks much more European style in that sense. So a lot of the capitals do have European style architecture. Uh, it's just an interesting look for a state house. I encourage you to look at it. Um, but as I was there in the chamber for the House of Representatives in New York, the Sergeant of Arms was there. He, he shared some stories with us that I found fascinating, um, including the fact that when the place was built, they, they built it on, on sand. Um, and eventually they had to dig it out, replace it with clay and with concrete. And then in the, the, the cornerstone that they laid, uh, they put, uh, I think, a copy of the Constitution, coins, other things that you know, would, would be there. So Perhaps at some centennial, it could be pulled out and reviewed, but uh, somebody lost it in the sense that they didn't mark which, which stone was the cornerstone. And so nobody's sure exactly which rock or which stone is the cornerstone of the building. And then in the actual chamber itself, the House of Representatives chamber, they built this massive, just beautiful stone archways, uh, stone ceiling, and all of these ornate archways. But apparently, whoever designed it, um, didn't quite get the calculations right. And so over time, the weight of that ceiling began to uh, cause it to fall, fall down. In fact, the legislator was walking in the chamber one day and a, a big rock kind of fell out of the ceiling and landed right next to him. That'll definitely wake you up in the morning. So eventually that ceiling had to be removed and replaced. And so again, just an interesting little bit of, of history. There's also supposed to be a ghost that haunts the state house. Um, everybody needs their little bit of lore there. But I was thinking about that as I returned back to Indiana and the sense of that's the New York State House, bad foundation, can't find the cornerstone, um, and then the ceiling caves in. Uh, and it kind of analogizing that to the American Republic and the sense that our foundation on Judeo Christian principles, um, we're losing that. And so the very foundation of the building is in question that. Our cornerstone, the, the rock upon which our republic rests. Uh, as Christians, we should certainly say that would be would be Christ, that his principles, though we understand that there are many non-Christians in the American Republic, we believe that biblical principles, the Imago Dei, is what would uh, bring true flourishing to our society as we head into the future. And then that uh, the weight 
of building society on this idea of freedom when people have no self-control, when everyone's just pursuing their own way, that that seems to kind of be um, breaking up a little bit. We see a little bit of a rock fall next to us. We, we wonder about how are things going to be going in the future. And yet in, in the midst of this, in this American Republic, we find ourselves, we're called to exercise a citizenship that's worthy of the gospel. And so I just thought that was an interesting analogy kind of, of where we are. Um, from New York State. And if you're from New York State, I'm not picking on you. It's a beautiful capital region, but I just found those stories interesting. So again, five lessons from 200 episodes. Those are the things that God has taught me as I've spoken to so many church leaders, um, so many of those that are working in the public square. And kind of one more time, gospel-centered citizenship is part of discipleship. Gospel-centered citizenship faces external threats. Number three, it faces internal pressures. Number four, it works. It actually gets uh, down in the dirt, plants new things, tries to figure out how to solve problems, but also think it's the best strategy. And then it is an expression of faithfulness. Let us be like the Apostle Paul and putting our citizenship to work in uncertain times. So there, there it is, five lessons from 200 episodes.